God bless you. God bless you. This is Hampty the Third, Pastor of Village Hills Fellowship. I want to welcome you to our Sunday service. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm just going to share my page and then we'll get started. I pray that all of you are doing well. I'm doing well. I'm, I'm back at the church today, partly because I wanted to see why our electric bill was almost twice as much and we weren't in the building but one time last week last year so last, last month so i'm like maybe there's something else that's on who joined us for sunday worship so i was like maybe something else is on right but I, I see that the i normally leave the heater on at about 65 so maybe something so i'm just going to turn it off completely <laughs> i'm, I'm going to turn it off completely today but uh, I'm a little shocked, so I'm gonna do a little bit of research and then I'll make some phone calls for sure, but I'm not sure why our bill is, is, at the, is at the place that it is. I'm gonna take a second just to kind of move this and then we'll, then we'll get started. So I pray that all of you are good. This week I wanted to share just a message from Matthew 6.33 about in God we trust. And I didn't really know what to title it. I didn't want to be fancy. Well, sometimes you do, you want to be fancy, but I, I couldn't think of anything fancy. So uh, I just said, this is where, where, where we are. This is a message that, or at least the scripture, this is my scripture for the year. This is what the Lord told me to focus on for this year. So I wanted to just take a time, some time to break it down. Most of us know what it means, but we need messages like this. I need messages like this to have a reminder. God bless you. I see uh, cheer. I feel like if some of you remember Romper Room, man, I'm, I'm dating myself like way back. Used to come on PBS, right? Channel, if you're in Los Angeles, Channel 28, right? And at the end, she would be, she would have like this magic mirror, right? It was white. And she was like, I see John and I see, I see Jamie, right? I see Yolanda and Rosalyn. I see Tierra, right? You see all these people. I'm thinking like maybe one day she'll say hemp. And I'm like, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> that's what I feel like right now. I feel like that, that romper room moment. But I pray that everybody's doing well. We'll pray and then we'll, we'll go in. I'm going to read from Matthew 6. I'm going to read 25 to 33, and just to kind of give you context, I'm going to read from the Amplified Bible, and then I'm going to come back to Matthew 6.33. I want to break it down and really just speak about our levels of trust in life and what we're doing sometimes and, and the decisions that we make. And it's so important because these are things, like the things that we're going to speak about today, these are things that many of us have been anxious about and it's okay to say that you're anxious today about something that that we're about to speak about okay it's okay to say that's where i am it doesn't mean that that's where you have to remain right it's, it's important for us to say this is where i am but then i can fix it i know where i'm starting from and then i can go and i can create a path seeking god to get to where he wants me to be so, so sometimes we don't want to really say where we are. We don't want to be honest about our feelings. We won't be honest about the place where I may be. I may be stuck. I may be feeling some type of way. I need to be able to admit that and say, this is where I am. Lord, I need help because I don't see my way out. And I need you to be able to light the path. I trust you. So because I trust you, I know you're going to lead me in the way everlasting. I know you're going to expose what's in me, which whether it's good or bad, and you're going to help me out of it. I need your help, Lord. Amen. So this is kind of that message. And we need messages like this to remind us of the importance of our priorities. So often we are surrounded by life. We are consumed and inundated with making money, having a certain type of job, what my title is, what type of car I drive, the clothes I'm wearing, right? The food I'm eating, it's all these things. I want to make sure my, my family has this type of life and we're going to these places and doing these things. We get caught up in that. We're surrounded by it every day. And sometimes because of that, what happens is the volume of the spirit speaking to us begins to decrease, right? It's like when you're turning the dial down, like I'm, I'm turning it down. I hear, I hear them less and less. 
the, 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 the volume of the word as I'm reading it speaks less and less to my heart because I'm so consumed with the things of my life. Amen? A lot of us find ourselves in that position, so I want to speak to that today. Amen. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Gracious Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, oh God, we just thank you for this time you've given us, oh God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for being with us all this week, Lord. We have faced many highs and we face lows, oh God, but the one constant is you. You've been with us, Lord God, every step of the way, Father God. As your word says, you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And we trust you, Lord God. And we thank you for this time you've given us to open our hearts and minds to receive your word today, Father God. Let it challenge us where necessary. Let it bring correction where necessary. Let it bring conviction, Father God. But most of all, Lord, let us leave, I pray, from this message with an even deeper commitment to serve you, Lord God, to seek ye first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. Father, we love you and we bless you, Lord. And I ask that you'll bring comfort and grace, Lord God, to the hurting, Lord God. Those that have needs, Father God, prick the hearts of those around them to go meet the needs, Lord God, and continue to help us to stand together, to weep with those who weep and to rejoice with those who rejoice, Father God. We bless you and we thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to read from Matthew 6, verses, Matthew 6, verses 25 to 33. I'm going to read from the Amplified Bible, and then I'm going to come back. Most of the information I'm going to read after that is going to probably be in the King James. Amen? So let's go to Matthew 6, verse 25. It says, Therefore I tell you, stop being worried or anxious, perpetually uneasy, distracted about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body as to what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow seed, nor reap the harvest, nor gather the crops into barns, yet your heavenly Father keeps feeding them. Are you not worth more than they? And who of you, by worrying, can add one hour to the length of his life? And why are you worried about clothes? See how the lilies and the wildflowers of the field grow. They do not labor, nor do they spin wool to make clothing. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory and splendor dressed himself uh, and dressed himself like one of these, not even him. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is alive, to, which is alive and green today and tomorrow is cut and thrown down as fuel into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not worry or be anxious, perpetually uneasy. Uh, or distracted, saying, what are we to eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? For the pagan Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, but do not worry, for your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But first and most importantly, seek, aim at, strive after his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, the attitude and character of God, and all these things will be given to you also. Amen? So we're looking at this theme about, really it comes down to trust. When, you, when I look at the theme, when he talks about don't be anxious or worried, a lot of times we're anxious and worried about things that are going to happen or could happen or has happened in our life. This perpetual, he talks about here in the Amplified, this perpetual uneasiness, right, or being distracted. How many of us in the last, probably since January 1st, how many times have you found yourself uneasy or distracted or anxious about something in your life, some decision that had to be made, or you know that something's about to end in your life? There's going to be a shift in your life, or something is about to transform, or, or I may have lost my job, or, or this has happened, or that happened, my health. Something has may have happened in your life to where you say, I'm anxious or worried. Hey, God bless you, John. We appreciate you uh, watching with us. Uh, Sister Stella, God bless you. Thank you so much. But it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Trying to find out why, why our bill was so high. <laughs> so definitely want to make sure that we was here to kind of check on some things. So when we look at this seeking first the kingdom of God, and to break this down, right, in the King James, it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. And it's about priorities. It comes first about seeking the kingdom of God and then seeking his righteousness. So what I'm going to do today prayerfully is to break these two down so we can say, okay, this is what this means for you. 
this is what it means for me. For me, as I told you before, this year, this is my word, my scripture for the year. The Lord told me, Ham, if you fulfill this scripture, I'm going to take care of you. Because for me, I have a major transition. A year from now, I'll be out of the military. I have 12 months left, less than, actually less than 12 months left in the United States Air Force. I may have even less, right? Because of my, my cancer diagnosis, some of you in the military know about a, a, mil, a medical evaluation board. I mean, it seemed like immediately. <laughs> so now I'm undergoing a medical evaluation board. I'll find out about it next month. So who knows what's going to happen. But the Lord told me just to trust in him. Right? Don't worry about it. If you don't reach 30 years, don't worry about it. Don't worry about any of that stuff. I got you. It's a position of trust. God bless you, Crystal. Thank you so much for joining us. So when we look at this word kingdom, in, in the Greek, it's, it means like royalty. Right? A rule and a realm. So when we think about royalty, we think of God. When we think about a rule, it is authority. Right? He provides commands by which he judges. That there's a standard in which he will, he will rule by and judge everyone whether or not they're accomplishing that which he has said by his authority. And then there is the realm, which is the location. So when we think about this, we think about this rule, we think about royalty, and we think about realm. I'll break down the other two and we'll come back to royalty in a second. Well, I'll talk about that here in just a minute. Because again, when we think about royalty, when you think about someone that's royal, when you think about a celebrity, or you think about a sports star, some superstar, MVP, what have you. When you think about the, the president and CEO of your company when he comes in or he, he or she comes in, what is the honor or reverence that you show these individuals? What do you do that may be different from your coworker, Jim Bob, that come in every day eating donuts and bringing in coffee? What's the difference in which you will show Sally Sue that may work in another department that you may work with on a daily basis. You would show those celebrities and these other individuals more reverence than you do as common folks. So what happens to us when we talk about priorities? What happens in our lives when we don't see God as royalty? as king of kings and lord of lords of our lives. It's one thing to say it out of our mouths. It's another thing to, to sing a song about it. But it's a totally different issue for us to say, Lord, you are the lord of my life. And I see you as greater than everyone else. Even greater than myself. Bless you, Marlon. Appreciate you joining us. That I see you as royalty. What would happen? When we see God as royalty, just and even greater than what we would see someone else that we is a celebrity or someone else of high importance. It's a difference. And some of you can see that difference. How you respond to a celebrity and are we respond to God with even more reverence? It's about a commitment to who we're following after. If he's royalty and we see him as royal. Right. When you think about even with the in, in England, with the Queen of England and you have you have all these these king, the king now, king and queen. And you have all these princes. Think about all the pomp and all the different things that go on to to support them. None of us can just walk in there. I can't just go down to England and just walk in the building. I'm not going in Buckingham Palace. I'm not getting in there. You're going to see those guards move at that point. There's a process and there's a protocol. But how are we responding to God? Is God a priority in life? Is he royalty in your life? Is he lowered? Not because you said it out your mouth, but because your action said so. Because we're talking about seeking first the kingdom of God. Because if God is the priority, then that means I'm going to be paying attention to what he's saying. See, when your boss, the CEO, is telling you to or is telling you what to do, you want your job, so you're gonna do what's necessary and maybe even do extra beyond what's being asked of you because you want to please them. 
You want to show them that you are a good worker. You're worthy of a promotion. You're worthy of additional opportunities, maybe to make more money over here or to do something else, to receive more notoriety, to receive more influence, to receive more opportunities. Come on, y'all. So then, will I have the same type of respect and reverence for God about royalty? That's first and foremost. Because then it comes down to if, he's, if I consider him as royalty in my life and Lord of my life, then I'm going to be paying attention to what he says. I'm going to be paying attention to what he wants me to do. I will pay attention to that more so than how I feel about a situation. How many of us have worked somewhere in a job and your boss tells you to do something that you don't want to do? Or there's tasks to be performed that you don't feel like doing. They, they bother you, you don't want to have nothing to do with them, but you know good and well that if you don't do them, your job may be on the line and you out. So you do them anyway because you know that's what the boss requires of you. God bless you, Ann. Thanks for joining us today. So then you think about that for a second. You know what the boss wants you to do, but you do it because sometimes out of obligation because you don't feel like doing it, but you do it because you know that you don't want to be fired. But yet here it is. A lot of us may not consider God to be a priority of our lives. He has the power not only to kill the body, but to put you in a heaven or hell. Creator of all things, all powerful, all knowing, in everywhere at the same time. But yet we may not have the same type of honor, reverence, and respect. When God asks us to do something, or you know his word will want you to do something, we're like, well, I don't feel like it. Right? I don't feel like being loving right now. I don't feel like being kind. I don't want to do that. Right? And we just leave it at that. I don't want to go there. I want to go to a church that does this. I want to be around some people that do this. Oh, no, I ain't going to love him. Oh, no, I'm going to hate that person forever. I'm never going to forgive. So what do you think happens when you look at royalty and rule? Because now the king has stated this is what happens and this is how I want my citizens to live and this is how I want you to, to abide by them. And if you don't, then these things happen. What happens to us when we say we are not considering the, the prominence that he should have in our lives? And because if he doesn't have prominence in our life, then I may, be, I may get to this place where I'm not going to do what he says or I consider his commands as maybe suggestions. So it's not really mandatory that I do these things, but yet I'm more com committed to my job. That's a lot of us. A lot of us are more committed to our jobs than we are to the Lord. This isn't about church work. I'm not talking about coming to church and cleaning. I'm talking about what's in our hearts. I want us to check ourselves. Are we more committed to the job that we have, that God gave us, and to the bosses that most of y'all don't like than we are to the one that gave it to us in the first place. So then when we think about his royalty, his rule, now his realm, his realm is the location and dwelling. So wherever, from what I have studied, wherever God permanently resides, that is where the kingdom of God is located. Now, in the scriptures, he speaks of two specific places that the kingdom of God is located. Number one, most of us will know as heaven, right? Isaiah 60, 66 and 1 says, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye built unto me and where is the place of my rest, right? Where he is, he says, heaven is my throne. We know he permanently resides there. The second place that he resides is in the heart of man. So when you look in the heart of man, in Luke 17, 20 and 21, he says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo, 
or are low here or low there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So when Jesus was walking the earth, the kingdom of God was not the earth because that was not his permanent dwelling. He talked about that in John 18 when talking to Pilate, right? He's, he's going under, uh, being, he's been betrayed already, right? He's going before Pilate, right, as far as the final judgment for his life. And then he's like, look, my kingdom is not of this world. He says this in John 18, 36. If my kingdom was of this world, then my servant would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. So when we think about this, the kingdom of God is a place in heaven and it is also within believers because the Holy Spirit lives within us. God's spirit permanently resides within us. And it speaks about this in John 14 and 6, how the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us. So now, what does this mean for me to seek ye first the kingdom of God? Now, to seek the kingdom of God is to worship, to desire, to endeavor, to inquire for, to require it. So it's almost like going on a long trip. If any of us have taken a trip across country or you're saying across the state where you need a GPS. So in this process or in this example, you have the kingdom of God. When I say that, when you say, hey, I'm seeking first the kingdom of God, I'm seeking the eternal, the eternal dwelling place of God in heaven, right? There's going to be a new heaven and earth. I'm seeking that. I want to get there. And what's inside of us in the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God internal, will give us directions on how to get there. So you think about this, right? I have the desire to get to this location. I put it in, right? I'm trying to get to Los Angeles. Boop, 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 boop. The GPS says, hey, turn left at this street, drive 100 miles, then get off, go here, go there. You have the instructions on which you are to receive. Amen. So there's two ways that this happens, these type of instructions. Everyone receives two different types of instructions. Amen. The first set of instructions, which we know is God's word. He will speak to us through his word and he will give us what we are to say and do. Amen. So that's why we read through. We're reading through the gospels in our Bible studies in the Bible study. We go through Matthew 28, 18 to 20, where he says, make disciples, teach all nations, which means to make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe everything he commanded. I teach this on Wednesdays to fulfill that scripture. Because as kingdom citizens, it is extremely important. It is paramount that we understand what Jesus is requiring of us because he's king. As the king of kings and lord of lords, he is giving his rule. These commands is, are, by, are the way in which every citizen must live by. So if we never read them, then how are we going to know what's required of us? And then just because we don't do it or we don't know about it, we have no excuse. Think about the time some of you as parents may tell your children, I want you to go make up your bed and then send them off. When they come back to you, you ask them, hey, did you make your bed up? No, but I cleaned my clothes. I washed all my clothes and folded them very nicely. They're all back in their, in their respective places. Now, as a parent, you're not going to congratulate your child for washing the clothes and folding them and putting them back where they belong or where they should have been, where they should be, right? You're going to get on them because you say, look, I told you to go make up your bed and you didn't do it. You're not going to even focus on the clothes, which may have been good for you to do, but I'm focused over here. So there's, there's words he's going to give us. So what God gives us is his word, right? He gives us his commands and principles through the Bible. I think my Bible's over there, but he gives it through, our, through the Bible for every one person. Right? So that's what he gives every single person in the world. And then he gives us 
what he, how he wants us to live. So think about it like this. I'll share this example and then we'll, then we'll keep going. So think about the federal government. In the United States of America, there are federal laws that reach every person, right? And if, if you're American, if you live in America, you've been here, there are federal laws that cover all 50 states. But then within the 50 states, each government has its own laws that do not supersede the federal government. So that's why some states have sales tax, some of them don't. So when you think about this, God will give you as the, the federal law, as the overarching law, these are the laws in which I want all citizens to abide by, right? God's word, when we're going through the gospels, like this is kingdom citizens, all kingdom citizens must live in this manner. That's why we teach it, it's important because we are inundated by the world. And the world is challenging the things that Jesus says. As we've been going through our studies, you, have, you may have seen for yourself how Jesus' teachings are almost in a direct contradiction to what we see in the world. So it's important for us to study. So what happens now, he has the, the overarching law, but then what he says, there's a different way I want you to live. Ham, I want you to join the military and you need to stay 30 years. My daughter, right, you, must, you will be a lawyer. Someone else, you will be a veterinarian. So I don't want to be a veterinarian. I don't have no desire to be a doctor, right? I thought about going and being an athletic trainer, right? Just looking at the uh, anatomy class, I was like, oh, no, I'm changing my major. It's done. <laughs> it's over, right? That, there's, I don't have no heart for that. I don't want that smoke. God gives you a specific way in which he wants you to live. There are specific things and places you must go that's specific to you. There is the overarching work, law. There, the overarching command in which you must live by. That's why we're in the Gospels. But then he comes back and says, I need you to live like this. This is your way. This is the way I want you to live. That's specific to you, and that is not comparable to any other person. Because what, you may be in a room with other people, right? You think about coming to church. There's other people in the church with you, but each of us has a different assignment that he has given us. So when you think about seeking first the kingdom of God, the first thing that I must do is about priorities. The first thing that I must do is I must consider his overarching word that he's spoken in the word of God. And I must think about what he spoke to me to do specifically. So, so that's what I'm seeking first. But if I'm in a situation, y'all, where I'm anxious, I'm worried, I, I begin to lose my sense of trust in what God's doing. I lose my sense of contentment that God's going to take care of me because I'm worried about something that's going on around me. I'm worried about clothes and food, and I'm worried about how something's going to turn out. I'm worried about whether I'm going to lose my job or get the job. I know there's a transition coming in my life, and I'm worried, I'm concerned about it. So he's saying here, in this context, you must seek me first. You must seek first my word, what, I what I've said, and I, you must seek what I've called you to do. You must understand that. The places and things that God wants you to do, most of the time, you will not want to do them. It is not about how you feel about situations. There are a ton of things that God has asked me to do that I don't want to do. I personally don't want to do them. I do them because he said so. And there are some hard things. It's not always, you know, the, as he said, in this life you have tribulation. David talks about many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all. There are going to be places and things that he wants you to do that's a part of the kingdom of God for you. Right? If you try to get to the, the ultimate kingdom of God to be with God in eternity, this is how you do it. This is the way. I'm showing you that, right, through Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and life. I'm giving you my laws. I'm giving you my rules. Because when I come back, I'm looking for a church without spot or blemish. I'm not looking for people that said, ah, uh, you know what? Uh, you know, instead of God, you know, I know God wants me to be over here, but I want to be over there. 
right? I, God told me to live in New York. I don't want to live in New York. I want peace in my life. So when I retire, I'm going to Florida and I'm going to be chilling. And I did all this great stuff for God, right? I lived this great life. It was relaxing and I helped some people. I worked in the homeless ministry. It was awesome. What God going to tell you when you see him? He going to say, I told you to be in New York. Away from me, you worker of iniquity. That's how it works. Just because you did a lot of good stuff doesn't excuse the fact that you didn't do what God said. So what I must be able to do is I must first say, okay, Lord, in this situation, I got to seek your word first in this situation. First, I must seek, okay, what you want me to do in this first? I mean, I've been struggling with that just in the last few weeks. And I didn't realize how often I actually seek my own way about doing something. I, I'll make a decision about something quick. And I've had to catch myself several times in the last couple of weeks, like, wait a minute, you got to seek first the kingdom of God. This may not be what God wants you to do in this moment. Go, go pray about it. Stop. Hold on. What does God want in this moment? <clears throat> what does God speak? Excuse me. What does God's word speak in this situation, this setting? What does God want me to do specifically for my life? There's so many times I was in the season last, several months ago anxious and worried about different things. I wanted things to happen faster than what God wanted to happen. God was like, look, Ham, I got you. I'm taking care of you right now. I'm just going to do it slower than what you want. But I've been like for like the last couple years, I've been trying to find ways to speed that thing up. And God wouldn't let none of it work. I mean, like I, I, no matter how much money I spent, no matter what I did, God, it was like an iron curtain. I ain't doing it. Right. But God was, he's been faithful, but I got anxious. And because I was getting anxious, I was not trusting in God the way I needed to. I wasn't patient. God's like, I, God's already taking care of what I, what I desire. It's just not what I want. Come on, y'all. So that's why God shut everything down. Right? Shut everything down with the real estate. Like, hey, your church, the church is not a priority. You need to fix your priorities and get this stuff right. So then, God bless you, Sister Jones. Thanks for, thanks for watching this. So then, join it with us. So then God's like, okay, let's build back up your priorities. The church is first, right? Even after kidney cancer, sitting here, I'm sitting at home, right? Not moving a lot. Not, I, I intentionally, like, I can't fill my day with a whole lot of stuff, right? It's been a great time of peace, reflection, meditation, prayer. Now I'm kind of getting out and about. God is like uh, uh, allowing me to add things back, right? There's a ministry that we're connected with. I'm a, we're, Lord willing, Yolanda and I will start volunteering there. Uh, what, another week or so? I mean, another couple weeks? Amen? So it's like, okay, what does God want me to do in this moment? How does he want me to live? So I got to seek that first. And all that I'm doing, first. Because we do, we, we, this life wants you, this world wants you to be worried. Wants you to live in fear. It wants you, right? Because if Satan is the, is the God of this earth, he wants you to trust in yourself. He wants you to be just like Eve, Adam and Eve were, right? He wants you to be the same way. Where you begin, let's go there real quick. Let's go, what is it, Genesis 3? Hold on, Genesis 3. Mm-hmm. So Genesis 3 and 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good, right? Hold on. I'm... When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to the desire to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. What did she do? She began to put her knowledge on this, right? I can see that the tree is good for food. I can see that it's pleasant to my eyes. And then I know that the tree is desired to make me wise. It has the ability to do these things. In all of that time, I didn't, in this moment, she didn't seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Right the, now, she said back to what what the serpent respond to her. Right, she told him like when he said, "Look, shall you not has the Lord said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden?" She said, she said, "We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said we should not eat of it." 
Thou shalt not touch it lest she die. That should be the end of the story. So that's me seeking. This is what God said. But see, for us, we got to be able to put a period on that. I can't go back and look at something and say, I desire it. It looks good. Right? It looks like it can make me wise. It looks like, right, that job can give me that. That man can give me that. That woman can give me that. That car can give me that. Come on, how many times are we doing that? We're seeking after all these things and never once be like, Lord, is this what you have for me? Some of us are going through it right now because we simply didn't ask God. We didn't seek the kingdom of God. So let's go into what it talks about in seeking the kingdom, his righteousness, right? We seek the kingdom of God. I need to know what he's saying to me in his word, overarching, and I need to know what he's saying to me on how, for, how I am to live specifically. Where does he want me to be? What does he want me to do? How does he want me to do it? Amen? So when we think about his righteousness... His righteousness being right standing with God. What happens here, righteousness is like this, it's, just, it's, called, it's like defined as justification. Now, in Romans 3, 1, uh, 21 to 26, it says in verse 22 that the righteousness of God comes through faith in Christ Jesus for all those Jews or Gentiles who believe and trust in him and acknowledge him as God's son. So we are justified through the work of Christ. We are made righteous through the work of Christ. And in verse 26 it says, It was to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus and rely confidently on him as Savior. So if we have faith in Jesus, it means that I will rely in him confidently on him as Savior. So I trust that he's going to, going to allow me to receive the eternal gift of life by my faith in him. So what happens, let's go to Hebrews 11 and 1. So this justification, I can't earn the justification. I can't run a couple of laps. I can't do 200 push-ups, right? It's not like a, I'm in the military, so it's not like me taking a physical fitness assessment. Every year we have to do that, right? I'm, I'm done with that. I don't have to do no more. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm done with that. I'm done with that stuff. Took my last test last year. That was it. So, but we can't do a test we can't prove, right, we can't do all these different things to prove that I'm worthy of justification, to be justified by God. That my sin would count, cancels me out because of sin nature. Remember, he's looking for a church without spot or blemish. You got sin on you, you're not justified, right? He's not looking for that. He's not looking for you. He said without spot or blemish. So Jesus is the one that covers us and cleanses us by his sacrifice cleanses us from all iniquity. So when I place my faith in Christ and I say that I will rely on him confidently as Savior, if he's my Savior, that means even when I don't see an answer, I'm going to still trust him to provide the solution. We in the 11th hour and 59 minutes, and it's getting down to the wire, I'm not going to be anxious. Lord, I'm going to trust you. If I say I got faith in you, that you're a good father. If I have faith in you and say that you'll never leave me nor forsake me. If I have faith in you to say that I know that you're a deliverer, at some point, you and I are going to have to show it. Prove it. Hebrews 11 and 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. When you read through the context, when you read through Hebrews 11, 1, especially when you get around verse 13, they're speaking of the faith is the eternal city of God. I'm hoping for it and I'm waiting for it. It's the substance of what I'm hoping, the tangible thing that I don't have, I'm not holding on to, 
but I want in my life. The evidence of what's not seen is that my actions show I believe that. If I say I believe heaven is mine, you can show believe my actions will support that. It will support that decision. I, I, one of the examples I give, I say I love my mom, but every time I see her, I slap her as hard as I can. Some of you will look at that and say, Brother Ham, you said you love your mom. Are you sure about that? Because every time I see you, you over here and you slap your mother as hard as you can. That don't look like love to me. It looks like something's wrong. What you saying and what you doing are two different things. Something's not right. Something's wrong here. So when I say I have faith, you got, let's go to James 2, uh, 17 and then 26, and then I'm, I'm about to close this thing. If I say I have faith and I confidently rely on Jesus as Savior, I believe in him, it means that my actions are going to line up with that. I'm going to show you by my actions, not to prove it to you. I'm just living my best life in Christ. I'm living my abundant life in Christ, but you're going to see that it lines up. That even when things are hard, even when it looked like God ain't going to come through, I'm not moving. I'm going to keep standing. See, Satan wants us to move and be anxious, right? Because when you're anxious, like in Proverbs 19.2, it talks about how we can sin and miss the mark. Because when we're anxious, we feel like we just got to do something. Any movement is better than no movement. And a lot of us, including Hamp Lee, is challenged to just be still. Man, it... It's been a blessing for me this last month to be still. This is the first time we've been in the church since December. Well, at least on a Sunday. But, but since my surgery in December, I've only been in the church once. So, you know, I, I, I want to I wanna keep trusting him, right? It's, it's been this peaceful time. But I struggle. Man, I struggle tremendously, right? I'm known as a person of action, like Action Jackson. Right, May the Lord bless and, and give peace to Carl Weathers' family. Right, Passed away uh, uh, recently this week. When, when we think about being able to trust him in the midst, in the face of dangers, in the face of the unknown, a lot of us struggle with that, y'all. There's a lot of situations in our lives that have a blank in it. And it's like this fill in the blank. But it seemed like God's taking too long to fill the blank in. So then we're going out to find our pen to write something in it for him. But, it, but oftentimes, nine times out of ten, that's not what God wanted for us. It may have been what made us feel comfortable, what made us want to feel secure, that gave us comfort. But it wasn't what God had. It wasn't his best for us. Come on, y'all. There is... There is when, when God talks about living an abundant life in John 10 and 10, God has abundant life for you. It doesn't, see, in this life, this world is not made for you to be eternally here. It's not made for us to, to have all these opportunities for eternal peace. There's going to be trauma and drama and crazy madness. There will be pockets of peace. We can have joy in the midst of trials and tribulations. Some of us, right, I had a post on, on my, online talking about some people don't know about, about, about waiting on the postman on 1st and 15th. I know about that, right, when I was growing up and younger, knowing about being on food stamps. But it seemed like I was super happy. I didn't have a lot of toys. I didn't have a lot of stuff. But, man, I made the most of what I had. Man, you have a couple sticks. Man, I'm doing all kind of stuff with that. But we can still have joy in the midst of what's going on in the world around us. Knowing that one day, bless you, Pache, thank you so much for joining us. Knowing that one day, it may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but I will be in heaven with, the, with, with Christ eternally. I'll be with the Father. I'll be with the Son forever. But now, right, I got to keep seeking the kingdom because that's the direction I want to go into. If I say that I want heaven, my actions need to line up with that and say that that's true. So that somebody can step back, not that I'm trying to prove anything to them, but they can step back and look at it and say, yeah, it looks like that person's trying to live like that. 
right? Not like the example I said, I love you, mama, and slap her. Like, no, that, that doesn't sound like that's right. And a lot of people today, as I talked about on Wednesday, are crucifying the Lord and bringing him to shame because our actions and what we say are not lining up. So it says here, let's go to James 2. I don't know if I want to read 17 to 26. Let's see. I'll read. I said, even so, faith, if it have not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast have faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. If I say I believe in God, if I'm seeking his righteousness, then I'm going to be doing it. I'm going to seek not just the justification, right? Justification from Christ comes to receiving him as Lord and Savior. Accepting him, right? Being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm coming to him. That gift, that justification, you do nothing but accept. But now that I'm in and I'm trying to get to heaven, I remain justified through my life of sanctification, through my obedience to everything that, that God is telling me, us in the word, right? Remember, seeking the kingdom, the overarching rule that he's given us, his commands, the scriptures that he's given to us, and the personal path that I have for you. So not only do I, I seek it first, I know it. Some of us know it, but we ain't doing nothing about it. See, his righteousness is being in right standing with him. That I'm doing that which you've commanded, overarching and telling me to do. I'm going where you tell me to go. I'm doing what you want me to do. I can promise you, so many times I've told you example after example of times when, Lord, I don't want to go there. I don't feel like doing that. I don't want to be without my family. I don't want to do this. And God's like, that's the, that's the path. That's my will for your life. I'm using your life to be a light to somebody else. I take you through all this drama and chaos so I can send you to another difficult place to help somebody else out because you'll have context now. All the things that we're going through, we don't, Yolanda, Yolanda and I, we don't talk about publicly a lot of things we're going through right now. We got a lot going on in our house. There's a whole lot. Beyond just some of the things you may, you know, may see on the surface. But we know and we can see it now and we're beginning to prepare for it that God is going to use all the things that we're experiencing now to help other people that are in need, to help them out. And it's been tough trying to find your way, trying to find God's will in the midst of a, a difficult situation when your flesh is screaming for you to either hit somebody, to leave, right? You're talking about fight or flight? Man, that's been me last few years. Sometimes you want to do both. You want to fight and flight. But when God's like, no, hold still, love, Forgive. Be patient. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. Love. What does love say? Love's long-suffering. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. That's where God's been dealing with me. Love, this week, literally, love keeps no record of wrongs. That's where he at with me right now. Because I realize when dealing with certain people, they do so much drama and chaos that I've been remembering what they're doing. And I was telling Yolanda that we have to be able to, be able to err on the side of grace because it's going to help our heart to get our hearts right. And that's for me, right? Because that's my big issue is I keep a record of wrongs a lot of times. And because we keep a record of wrongs, we can't love properly. We can't love like God wants us to love. That's a problem. That becomes a problem when I say, seek ye first the kingdom of God, because the kingdom of God be like, forgive that person. And I'd be like, oh, no, I ain't forgiving them. Oh, no, I'm holding on to this. Oh, there's a problem. Because now... I know what you want me to do, but I'm not willing to seek the righteousness and be justified and live in right standing for you, Lord. There's a problem. So I got to ask myself, right? Even now, there's, there's a situation where I need to forgive somebody. All right, I think I did. I think I, think I still got some issues, right? <laughs> some, some other issues with what they've done, but I just need to forgive it. And I felt that yesterday, talking to him yesterday, I was like, hmm. You know, I thought about it. It's like, man, maybe I'm not where I need to be right now with this person, right? God says forgive. There's, there's not an asterisk, right? In Matthew 6, 14, 15, there's not like a little asterisk that says, you know, let, let, let me read that real quick. Let me read the scripture. 
I'm going to close. I don't want to just be rambling. Well, not rambling, but, you know, I just get to talking. But it says, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. There's not an asterisk that says, for these situations, it's okay to hold on to forgive, unforgiveness. Right? That's not there. I still need to forgive. And I have to think about it in such a way that it's not worth the cost of my admission into the eternal kingdom of God. It's not worth it to hold on to this anger and unforgiveness to what somebody may have done to somebody, to me or somebody I love. It's not worth it. As much as most people around me will probably say, Hamp, I agree with what you're doing, or, or they would say, Hamp, I understand why you feel that way. God will still come to me and say, Hamp, I need you to forgive that person. I need you to treat them right. When I pastor 10 years ago, 10 plus years ago, God said forgiveness is treating a person as if they never wronged you. That's, that's the standard. See, remember what I told you, right? In God's word, he talks about forgiveness. Forgive men their trespasses. God came to me and said, Ham, forgiveness is treating a person as if you've never wronged them. That's always been my litmus test to know whether or not I forgave somebody or not. If I can't treat them the way that, they, that, I, that, that I treat them prior to them doing that to me or whatever they said or did, I know I ain't walking in true forgiveness and I need to fix it. So I got to keep working with God. And if there comes a problem in my life where I say, Lord, I'm struggling with that, tell them. I know that your word is telling me to forgive, but Lord, I'm struggling because I don't want to forgive. I, I want to keep hating them for what they did to me or did to whoever. I don't want that, Lord. But I know your words say that I need to. So I need some help. I need your grace, right? I need your grace. Your, as it says in, in 2 Corinthians 12, right? Your grace is sufficient for your power is made perfect in weakness. I need your help. If you are in a place right now and you're struggling to do what God's asking you to do, you just tell him, like, Lord, I'm struggling. I talked about pornography or, what, you know, Lord, I'm struggling. I thought I'd live with that forever. Like, for real, I thought I'd just be cycling it out of it. I've been trying for years and nothing's working. I, I needed grace from God. And God tells me, Ham, you don't have to sin sexually. I'm like, Lord, what are you talking about? I've been struggling with this all my life. I'm trying. And he's like, Ham, I got you. But it's like, I'm going to give you the grace and encourage and strengthen you. Not do it because you're calling out to me. Sometimes some of us just got to raise the right flag and say, Lord, I give up. A lot of us, right, we hear in these scriptures worried about so much stuff and we anxious because we keep trying our own way. And we're not at a place where we're sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired of doing it our way where we say, Lord, I just need some help. For a lot of us, if we simply just raised up the white flag and say, Lord, I surrender, I can't. All right, I'm, that's where I got to. And I'm trying to come out. I just got to this place that, Lord, I surrender. I'm tired, Lord. I can't keep trying to do stuff, knowing you ain't gonna, you're going to keep blocking it, knowing you, you ain't going to let this thing work. I just got to be patient and wait on you, Lord. I, I don't know what else to do, Father. I give up. That's probably what he's waiting on most of us to do and say. The gospel is meant for us to be able to say, Lord, I can't do this on my own, and I need you. Think about, look at what happened when, when Adam and Eve, when Eve said, I can be wise. I can be like God. This food, this food, it looks good to eat. It's pleasant to my eyes, and it can make me wise. When, when, when she made the decision to say, no, I think there's something that, that's for me in that. And maybe I don't need God. I can be like him. That's what Satan wants. This, that's what the world wants. I want you to have any type of dependence on anything and anybody but, but God. But we have to say in this moment, in God we trust. That even in the midst of all the things and lack and whatever may happen in this life, that I say, Lord, I'm going to seek you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to remain still, and I'm going to move when you tell me to move. I'm going to speak when you tell me to speak. And I'm going to speak the words you want me to speak. I'm going to live by the word in which you've given, even when it's hard. If it's hard, some of y'all, while I'm talking, some of you are thinking about specific things, then that's when you go to God and ask, say, Lord, I need some help. That's when you reach out to a man or woman of God. Like, look, I need some help. Tell somebody. 
Don't be trying to, to, to do this stuff on your own. That's not, it's not meant to do. There are things that you need to do on your own, but if you're struggling, ask for help. Lord, Lord, I need some help. Help me, Jesus. Go call, phone a friend. Call a pastor. Call another person you may respect and say, look, I need some help. I don't know what to do. Can you pray for me? Pray with me. Because I want to live for God. Because if this is the place I want to go to, if I want to be in heaven, if I want to be in the new heaven and earth with God forever, he's telling you how to get there. And I promise you, y'all, it ain't easy. It ain't easy on the flesh. I can tell you, it's not easy on the flesh at all. <laughs> My flesh be burning, hurting, but it'd be worth it. I promise you, man. I told y'all, when your pinky toe hits heaven, you're going to be like, man, it was all worth it. When you in eternity with God, you're going to be like, man, it was all worth it. Thank you, Jesus. But in this life, there's going to be so much that's going to try to fight that. So much that's going to come against you to keep you from seeking the kingdom. I mean, just in general, not even first, but just seeking the kingdom at all. Inundated with so much in this world. But to do this, right, for us to be able to seek first the kingdom of God, we have to see God as royalty and make him a priority. I have, you have to, in a lot of times, consciously think about the situation itself at hand. You have to be cognizant in every moment. And this, I'm learning how to do this myself. Because like I said, I didn't realize how often I was making decisions and then without even asking God about it or, or, or checking in. right? I, I, I was like, oh, wow, I do a whole lot of stuff. But no, let me stop. This isn't what God wants for me. This, I don't believe this. I don't have any peace about it. The peace of God that will rule in your heart to tell you and show you. Like now, there's things that you may be doing. You're like, I don't have no peace about this. Uh, I don't know. Something ain't right. Pause. Don't, go, don't keep going forward in that direction. Stop. Okay, I don't have any peace about it. Let me ask God about this. Right? A lot of times God will speak to you like that. Like, all right, I don't have a peace. All right, fine. Stop what you're doing and go seek the Lord. Go seek help. And then so we can learn how to make seeking the kingdom first and his righteousness a habit and where it becomes muscle memory. Well, that's the first thing I'm always doing. I'm always seeking his word. And I'm always seeking the guidance that he's specifically given me so that I can always be in right standing with him. Just because you're in right standing with him doesn't mean that the whole world is going to applaud you. You may face uh, tremendous opposition because you're in right standing with God. But God is there to applaud you and to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. That's what we're living for, not the applause of all people. A lot of the things you're going to do, you may do in this life for God. People even in the church may shun you because they don't understand it. Because it's not what they're used to seeing. But if you're being faithful to God, you're seeking him first, you know that one day your place will be in eternity with him. And then you can pray for your brothers and your sisters that they too may find the Lord. Amen? I so much appreciate all of you watching with us and being with us. And I pray that there's something that's been said today that will help you. Let's, let's pray real quick after this prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for this time you've given us, Lord God. Father, many of us in different places and areas of our lives struggle to trust you. We struggle, Lord God, with the means to be able to give our all to you first, Lord God. Forgive us, Lord God, for those times of anxiousness, Lord God, where we've been worried and perpetually distracted, Lord God, and consumed with so much in this life, Lord God, that it caused us not to consider you first, Lord God, and, and consider you the priority that you should be in our lives, Father, Lord God. Forgive us, Lord. Give us strength, Lord God, grace by your grace, Lord God, in our weak areas, Lord God. Help us, Lord God. We surrender, Lord God, the areas of our lives that we tried to do it our own way and failed. Even if it worked and we are successful, Lord, forgive us, Lord God, for doing those things, Lord God, that wasn't according to your plan for us. Help us, Lord God, to align ourselves with your plan, even if it means we won't be successful. We may not have as much money. We may not have all the notoriety and things that we had envisioned for our lives. But we know it's in your perfect will. Help us, Lord, to desire your perfect will. That we will show by our actions that we truly believe that heaven is our home. Father, we love you. 
And we bless you, Lord God, and I ask for your continued help for each and every person. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. I appreciate you all watching this. If you watch this message and you do not know the Lord, and you say, man, I want to be a Christian. I want to know the Lord personally. I want to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, but I don't know him. Reach out to us. We would love to be able to talk with you about the greatest love story ever written, to talk to you about counting the cost of what it means to be a disciple. There's a lot that comes with that, right? The word tells us, right, to count the cost of what it means to be a disciple so that we can finish the race. We can finish it through all the hardships, through all the trials, through all the affliction. We can finish and finish well. Amen. And we'll baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ if you're here locally. If not, we'll find a church for you. Or if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or prayer requests, please feel free to reach out to us. Please do not do this life alone. Don't try to fight it yourself. Say, look, I'm not strong enough. Hamp Lee's not strong enough. Right? I'm a big, I'm a pretty big guy. I like to be right now, I'm two, six, five, 230. That's that's a pretty big person. I saw myself on video the other day, right? They, I went to a men, a pastor's luncheon, and they were panning, there's pan in the room and I saw myself I'm like man I'm like pretty big I didn't really you know I don't always think about how large I may be compared to other people but I'm a big person but even me I need help and I need to put the white flag up and say Lord I need some help I can't do this on my own I, I'm not gonna get it right and most of the time nine times out of ten I get it wrong and so I need the Lord amen so I just reach out to us and say look I just need some prayer I need some help you know, we'll jump on a call. We'll jump on a Zoom call. If you're here locally, we go out to go out to lunch or grab some. Well, you can grab coffee. I'll drink some tea or some water or something. But we can, you know, we, we're here to help. We just want you to live as a faithful disciple unto Jesus that you may hear, well done, that good and faithful servant. Servants do what the master's asking. And we just want you to be faithful. We want to be faithful. And we pray that in community, we can all help and encourage one of us to do the same. Amen. So until the next time, y'all. Y'all be blessed. Uh, I don't think I have anything for this week. We'll go if we have we'll have some administrative notes coming for Wednesday. But if you have anything until then, let us know. But until the next time, y'all keep looking to the hills. God bless you. We love you. Take care.